Investors Chronicle. Hello and welcome back to the IC Interviews. I'm Mary McDougall and with me in the studio today, I'm delighted to welcome Tim Levine, co-founder and CEO of Augmentum Fintech, the UK's only investment trust that focuses specifically on investing in unquoted fintech companies. Tim started his career career as a consultant at Bain & Co., then became an entrepreneur co-founding juice company Crush and betting exchange Flutter.com, which then merged with Betfair.com. In 2005, he moved to Hong Kong for three years before returning to London and setting up Augmentum in 2009 with backing from RIT Capital Partners. Augmentum Fintech Investment Trust listed in 2018 and now has £267 million of assets. Tim, thank you for joining me. How are you? Mary, good afternoon. Lovely to see you. Well, you've got you've had quite broad experience. You co-founded companies that weren't fintech companies. Why, when you set up Augmentum, and why now is it fintech that you choose to focus on? So I think if I go back to why fintech, it was really my experience at Flutter and Betfair, looking at an industry where the UK could really be uh, the centre of gravity. Um, If you go back to 2000 and you were looking at industries that were being disrupted, we really pointed to Silicon Valley in particular. And the betting industry was an industry very concentrated around the UK, a lot of issues in the US from a regulatory point of view. And we started to see that first real hub of innovation in the early noughties in the UK. And I think that really taught me a lesson when after a few years of uh, both Flutter and Betfair, the incumbents, if you can hark back to the late 90s, you had the likes of Coral Labricks and William Hill really dominating an industry where they had nearly 85, 90% market share. And within a few years, the challengers were really eating into that market share. And before long, Betfair was bigger than all three of them and soon enough bigger than all three of them put together. So I think when I came back from Asia after a few years there, I was looking for another industry that had yet to be really fully disrupted. And financial service was the really obvious one hitting me in the face. I think the challenge for me was I didn't really know a lot about financial services. Uh, Not that that had ever stopped me before. I didn't know anything about uh, smoothies and I didn't know anything about betting. But what I did recognize was that there was a real opportunity in the market. I think post-financial crisis, you could see the first catalysts of change. And we were incredibly well positioned here in the UK. This is the global financial center. We had an infrastructure where you had uh, both a regulator, you had a central bank and a government all positively disposed to innovation, to disruption, to stimulating competition. So from my point of view, it was inevitable that that change would come. And the question was, how quickly would it come? I think our challenge as investors is always not to be right, but not to be right too soon. And so for me, it was a question of, can I cut my teeth, one, as an investor, and two, in a sector where I really needed to build that incumbent uh, knowledge. And that was the start of the journey for me. Well, the regulations must have hit you in the face coming from the gambling industry. It's it's interesting that you say that the UK is really well positioned because I was listening to you on the Wharton FinTech podcast, which was published a couple of weeks ago, and you said that you increasingly saw better opportunities in Europe than in the UK. So I think I'd qualify that. I would say better value opportunities in Europe than the UK. I think the UK, if you look at the stats, Every pound that's invested in fintech in Europe, more than 50p, is invested here in the UK, of which the majority of that is in London. I think the flood of capital that has come into our sector, both here in the UK and across Europe, has you know, really created um, you know, a significant volume of opportunity, but also more competition. And I think from our point of view, we're increasingly looking elsewhere in Europe at um, Uh, pockets of what we would regard excellence in fintech, where you've had ecosystems organically develop as a result of very successful outlier success stories in fintech. So I could point to Adyen in Amsterdam um, or TransferWise in Tallinn in Estonia, um, you know, or other markets in Scandinavia, so Klarna in Stockholm. And when you have these really successful outcomes in fintech, you create a new generation of both investors and early employees who to, you know, suddenly generate a return and want to go out and do it again, either through investing or creating their own company. And you're seeing these ecosystems develop across Europe. And it's important for us as a fund, not just to focus on what we think is the center of European fintech here in London, but also kind of elsewhere. So I think there's a lot of opportunities still to explore here in the UK, but increasingly we can't just narrow ourselves uh, to London or, you know, other major cities in, uh, in the UK. We are looking elsewhere. 
And if you look at our last six or seven investments, I would hazard a guess that you know, most of them were outside of the UK. But ultimately, we still spend a lot of time focusing on opportunities here. The last investment that I led on was a business called Cushion, which is a workplace pension platform, which is here based in London. Do, do you worry about valuations getting too hot in the fintech sector? Looking at um, the KPMG's Pulse of Fintech report said that UK fintech investment hit 37 billion last year, which is a staggering increase from the previous year, although that was artificially low. But you have, you mentioned Revolut and Klarna, they're on huge valuations. Wise listed last year and its share prices um, collapsed since then. Yes, I mean, I think Valuation is always a topic of great debate, both amongst our investors uh, and for us, we haven't invested this year. We didn't invest uh, very much in Q4 of last year. And I wrote in my interim statement that we see a lot of great companies that aren't necessarily going to be great investments. And ultimately, that is a feature of uh, valuation. We're in the business of taking calculated risk. And when you take that risk, you want to be rewarded for the ones that you get right. And if you're paying a price that isn't fairly reflecting that risk, then ultimately that's not uh, an investment that that we can make. So I think, you know, I've quite publicly said that I don't think the market will match last year's numbers. There was a huge flood of capital that came into the market. I would call some of that capital tourist money, money that was coming in that was looking for any exposure to fintech because it is a hot and exciting sector with a lot of potential, but it wasn't particularly discriminating um, in uh, their particular assessment. And that really did in parts of the market inflate prices. And from our point of view as a specialist investor, we can identify, in our view, great opportunities and great companies, but ultimately we have to be able to see the return potential. And in many cases, we simply didn't. So I think for us, we sat on our hands a lot. Um, we are starting to see the tide go out. And when you definitely uh, see the tide go out, you then see some of that tourist money start to disappear. And I think we'll start to see that. uh, And I think we'll continue to see that. So I think that's a good thing for the market. You want the pricing to be reflective of the opportunity and the potential. Um, But ultimately, we still have a long way to go in the sector. It's just making sure that you've got the right pool of investors who are supporting these businesses. And ultimately, the market will determine what the right pricing is. But we're certainly seeing some of that pricing uh, come off um, over the last kind of three to six months, and you're seeing the, the real impact of that now at the current time. Well, I want to dig into the portfolio, but just before we do that, the Khalifa Review of Fintech was published early last year and made lots of recommendations for how the government can support fintech in areas from investment policy to regulation and skills. Some measures have been taken since. What do you think of progress in this area? So I think aspects um, of the review have, you know, moved forward in quite a positive way. Um, There's no question that the uh, skills uh, agenda, the um, IPO, uh, which uh, was in parallel with the Hill report as well, and I think some of those recommendations have started to to be implemented, in some cases have been implemented, Um, clearly kind of creating the center of excellence. Uh, is one area where we will see that kind of implemented. I think the one aspect which was always going to be a challenge, in my view, was the investment piece, where they wanted to stimulate and create a fintech growth fund. In my view now, we do have the depth of capital in the European fintech ecosystem in order to allow our businesses to grow to their full potential. So I don't think that is a significant priority, but I think a lot of what was in the review was incredibly well received, not just by by government, um, but also by the industry as well. So I think there's a lot of positive momentum there. Um, And certainly it's uh, it's a report that's, you know, received a fair bit of scrutiny and will continue, I think, to be measured uh, on on an ongoing basis. But, you know, we input it into parts of that report. Um, And as I said, I think it's all about pushing the industry forward in a really positive direction. So, you know, long may that continue. Now, back to the portfolio, you said earlier that valuations have started to come off in the last three to six months. Your NAV is published every six months, so it hasn't been published for a while. How's the portfolio been impacted? So for us, I think we're 
less impacted by the day-to-day uh, volatility of the public markets. I think when we talk about valuation inflation, we saw a lot of that in the public markets. And if we point to US listed fintech, at the peak last year, those businesses that ha- that were listed were trading at about 17 times forward 12 months revenue. So unprecedented multiples. If I look at our top 10 holdings and look at where we were valuing them in terms of forward uh, 12 months, they were running at about 4.2 times forward revenue. And if I look at them now, it's about 4.3. So what we're not doing is marking to market uh, on a weekly, on a monthly basis. It's not our job to uh, adjust our valuations to the vagaries of the public market. So we feel from our perspective, the, our portfolio didn't benefit from a valuation point of view from uh, you know the the top of the uh, bull market last year in in the US, but at the same time we shouldn't be um, you know re-rated downwards as a result of that market really coming off 60, 70 percent in in some cases. So uh, you know our job, as I said earlier, is not to get swept up with some of the um, uh, you know overheated. Uh, opportunities in the market. It's to take a long-term view. Um, and, you know, we still feel that the businesses that we're backing have strong fundamentals. Value has kind of stayed um, stayed strong. And, you know, we'll issue our, our new NAV later in the summer. And, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, we feel that we're going to continue to, you know, push things in the right direction. Yeah, I guess the premium and the discount of the investment trust has done that for you. <laughs> um how I mean, you said you look at forward revenues. Are there any other valuation metrics? How do you value these companies? So I think for us, we'll value businesses on a variety of methods. I think the the devil's in the details. So twice a year, the auditors will run the rule. In our case, it's uh, it's BDO. We will prepare a set of valuations that they will run through uh, and pretty rigorously test and come back and agree or disagree uh, company by company. Uh, And it is very much kind of a bottom up approach. Um, Now, you could use probably, I would say, three key methods for us. One, which is, you know, the most recent uh, fundraising round. So if you have an external round within the last six months, then often we would look to that as that has been independently valued in the market. Um, secondly, we would um, have a structure where often the capital that we put in would be put in as preference shares. So in effect, if we put £5 million into a company, we would have a different class of share and that £5 million would sit above the equity that's um, gone previously. And if we maintain that value at £5 million, even if the company was valued at 50, if that business was then sold for £10 million, we would get our £5 million back as being the last money that has gone into that business. And that's kind of where uh, it's an important measure for both retail investors to really understand that we're trying to put downside protection in our deals as much as we hope for uh, for the upside. Ultimately, where possible, we do want to structure uh, the equity where we are protecting for the downside because inevitably we won't always get it right. And if we can get our money back in a situation where that hasn't worked quite as we uh, would like, uh, then that's a pretty kind of positive outcome from perhaps not an ideal investment. So the, the fund was listed in 2018, so it's still quite young. Have you had any that have gone wrong yet and that's been put into practice? Um so I would say in you know in the current fund we've certainly had investments that haven't tracked as well as we would hope and I think you have two choices in those situations one firstly you need to understand why it's not working as well as you hope and it could be a timing issue do you want to continue to support that business can you put changes in place uh, taking your role as an investor and often as a board director to help influence uh, and stimulate change um Or secondly, you sit there and take a view, do I want to put more money in if I don't fundamentally believe if we got the earlier decision wrong? Um, And can you find a buyer for your stake or can the business be sold? And I think in some cases, um, you know, we have done that where we've sold assets that haven't quite gone as we would like, but we took a return from that. And uh, in other cases, we've got businesses where we remain, um, you know, very strongly supportive, where we've got strong conviction, where perhaps haven't quite hit their targets. Um, But, you know, over time, we fundamentally believe that they will. And then, of course, I think the adage of venture 
is you've just got to make sure your better decisions uh, can really kind of come through and they um, you know outperform the ones that you haven't got quite uh, right. And I think if we can do that, then we can deliver that long-term RR rate of return of about 20% a year. And if you look at our internal rate of return of our deployed capital, um, we're tracking north of 20% of our invested money. So we're on the right track and you know we've got good momentum but you you're right to say it's four years since inception um really we've deployed our money over you know consistently over that period so some of our businesses we've only invested in for for a few months um but you know we're certainly expecting to you know see a continual flow um of returns and realizations uh, over the coming years of which our first meaningful one has just come through with Interactive Investor, which has announced its sale to Aberdeen, which uh, you know we hope to close in the not too distant future. That's that was your biggest holding. Um, you were on the board of Interactive Investor. Now I had heard that the company was speaking to investment banks and looking at listing, and I guess price is the obvious reason as to why you would sell to Aberdeen. But do you have a preference on how companies come to market? Maybe talk us through what you viewed the pros and cons of different options and why it was. So I was on the board of Interactive Investor for many years and that was a really interesting and sometimes a roller coaster journey. I wasn't on the board um, at the point in which we um, sold uh, the business to to Aberdeen. So I can't really give you a insider's perspective of exactly the conversations at the board table, but certainly you know, I can talk you through the options for all of our businesses at the point of which they become ready for sale or there's an unsolicited inquiry is to, you know, look at it objectively. And I think whether it's an IPO, uh, whether it's private equity bar or, or whether it is a strategic looking to come in, ultimately you're driven about what's going to deliver the optimal return for our shareholders. And so I think one has always to be agnostic as to that. I think IPO is, of course, the, uh, is, is the headline grabber. I think if you look over the last five years in fintech exits, 95% approximately have gone to M&A and only 5% to IPO. So that gives you a sense that this is an industry that attracts a lot of acquisitive behavior from both PE, but in particular from strategics. And I think you're going to see a lot more activity from strategics. Um, And when I talk about strategics, I'm talking about the traditional financial services, incumbents, the big banks, the big big insurers who are fighting massive challenges with digital transformation. Despite huge sums invested over the past 10, 15 years, they have not managed to digitally transform their business. They see the B2C fintechs as a competitive threat, they perhaps see them a little bit more seriously than they did a few years ago. And I think you will see more and more acquisitive behavior in the space. Yeah. So it's not like selling a pet and wanting wanting a nice home. No, that that makes sense. Thank you. Um, It's interesting because I view Interactive Investor as a more traditional investment platform. Its main competitors are Hargreaves, Landstein, AJ Bell. There's a new wave of um, commission-free brokers coming through like free trade do you think mm. do you think they pose as a threat not really if, if i'm totally honest i i mean interactive investor the opportunity when we made that investment wasn't an obvious one it wasn't an obvious venture investment but we were looking at the evolution of aj bell and hargreaves who weren't a digital first proposition and although interactive was an old digital brand, it was still digital and it had a very much pure digital play and we felt there was room um, for a platform to really get to scale and to be the price leader in that space. I think if you look at this new wave of investment uh, platform saving platforms, the challenge they have and one of the reasons you don't see these types of businesses in our portfolio currently is they take a fair bit of time to get to scale. When I talk about scale, I'm talking about assets. And so although free trade and chip and plum and money box are all brands where I would say millennials and Gen Y are using and trading, 
the challenge that we see is that the, these cohorts of customers don't have significant investable assets. And so for these businesses to get to significant AUA or AUM takes a long time and a lot of capital. So if you look at the average age of a free trade or money box customer, I would hazard a guess to say it is late 20s, early 30s. And if you look at the interactive uh, investor average customer, it would be late 40s. And the average balance would be six uh, figures versus four figures with the other one. So very different customer bases and the unit economics are quite different. So not as attractive. And I think if you look at those companies, those investment funds, venture capital funds, you would tend to see more strategics, the likes of Fidelity, uh, who have invested where they see a longer term strategic play in investing in a money box, as an example. Yeah. Um, for us, we don't necessarily see the, uh, the return play. And so we've been more reflective um, and less kind of enthusiastic about deploying capital in that space. You do invest in some, might we call them more alternative retail platforms. Yeah. Cedars, Bullion Vault, Whiskey Invest Direct, which I think is owned by Bullion Vault and Cedars. Yeah. So we exited Cedars last year. Um, I think kind of equity for crowdfunding, you know, remains kind of an interesting area. I think we saw an opportunity to uh, take some money off the table. Um, I think there's still, you know, a lot of potential in that space, but it perhaps wasn't moving as fast. And I think that is a good example where we receive an offer and we look at it objectively and remove emotion and say, should we, uh, you know, sell our position? And that was certainly, uh, you know, one example of that. I think, you know, Bullion Vault is a good example where you can look at a niche and say, you know, can they become the market leader in uh, precious metals? So gold, silver, platinum, palladium, and then by far away, the largest online player for retail investors to own and hold physical uh, bullion. And, you know, they built that business. They have well over $4 billion of assets on the platform vaulted in a variety of cities, depending on where you want to vault and have become the clear market leader. Great unit economics. That is a really uh, profitable business. Um, and, you know, the question for us then is, you know, at what point do you, uh, you know, seek an exit for a business such as that, which has hit scale, hit profitability, but how much more kind of room uh, does it have to uh, grow? And that's kind of when the challenge comes in to say, do we look to realize that asset or do we still believe there's, uh, you know, further upside to come? Do you have, when you buy a company, do you have your exit plan in place? Um, the reality is, you can never have an exit plan in place on day one. Um, of course, you need to have a sense of if this business is successful and gets to scale, what are the types of buyers that would come in? And if you struggle to identify who would ever buy this business, then it's probably not a good uh, investment to make. But I would also say if you build a business that is performing well as a high quality asset, then you don't need to actively uh, look for a bar, the bars will come looking for you. So as much as you need to kind of have a reasonable understanding that this is a sellable asset, ultimately, if you go in with a fixated view of how and when you're going to sell it, then ultimately, you're rarely right. We've talked about the environment being a bit harder, valuations coming down in recent months, but the operating environment for the companies themselves, Bank of England's predicted that inflation might hit 10%. In the autumn, what's the pricing power like for the companies? How will they hold up in a period, a prolonged period of elevated inflation? So, I mean, it's it's a good question, and it's it's a hard question to answer uh, too specifically. I, I mean, not meaning to be flippant, but ultimately, these are businesses that are growing incredibly fast. In many cases, they see a huge market opportunity ahead of them. Um, some of them are growing 100, 200% a year. So the question is, you know, is inflation something they're feeling day to day? And, you know, I would say it's not something that is uh, being discussed around the board table, if I'm perfectly yeah. honest. One of the challenges and one of the questions we are certainly discussing, um, you know, around the board table is, you know, cash runway. How much investment do they want to make? Do they want to cut back? Is raising capital next year or later this year going to be as easy as it was last year, perhaps? And probably not. So it is about thinking 
about being more prudent, about extending runway and preserving the capital where they can. It doesn't mean that we want them to slow down dramatically their growth, but also that the bull market isn't going to uh, you know, continue forever, and for them to think kind of quite realistically, uh, you know, about the uh, you know prospects of raising further capital, and I think that's something where we are having regular conversations with our portfolio CEOs and senior management to say, you know, the market is changing, um, and you know, think carefully about your burn rate over the next twelve to eighteen months and how you might adjust your runway accordingly. That was going to be my next question. How concerned are you about the sort of Raising capital getting harder. Uh, well, uh, you know, I think you you have to be somewhat concerned. I think if you have a high quality business in this market, you will always raise capital. The question is how much and at what price. And you know, I think that's the key question. If I had a business that was um, all sizzle and no substance, then I would be you know worrying a fair bit. I think what we're looking to do is back businesses with real fundamentals. Um, and, you know, hopefully they can continue to kind of grow at a, at a fair clip and, you know, be attractive to, uh, to external investors. And, you know, for us, I mean, I think the rule of venture is to continue to back your winners. Uh, I think I learned that early on in, uh, you know, in the previous fund where, you know, we ran out of runway in terms of capital and we couldn't defend our position. Now, ultimately we had a very successful exit in one business but we saw our equity position be diluted and we could have made, you know, a, a lot more in terms of return for our investors had we kind of managed to maintain our position. And so, you know, our job is to really back our winners all the way and that will ultimately maximise our return uh, down the line at the point of exit. Would you ever own them through flotation? Well, I think, would we hold... So would is, is the question, would we hold listed stock... Yes. once it IPO'd. Yeah. You know, ultimately, our job is to provide diversified exposure to private fintech assets, i.e. allow retail investors to access the inaccessible. I think if we had a portfolio full of listed public fintech companies, and I think our differentiation starts to uh, move away. However, I think on day one of an IPO, you're often subject to things like a lockup where we wouldn't be able to uh, sell in some cases. So I think there would be some compelling reasons as to why we'd hold on to uh, some equity, but ultimately we'd look to realize that. However, if we felt that the stock, one reason or another, wasn't trading at the value which we thought it was reflective and we couldn't invest that capital better elsewhere, then again, I think that would be a good reason to hold on to it. So giving the hypothetical answer of if I was an investor in Wise and I was locked up for a year and I looked at the market today and saw that it had come off, I'm not quite sure, 50, 60% since IPO, and I felt that now wasn't the time to sell, then I think that would be a good reason to say to investors, well, hang on, we think the market is not truly valuing this business and it will recover in the next 12 months and we should hang on to sell our position for, for another 12 to 18 months at this point. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I think the default view should be we will look to realize that and reinvest it. Um, but, you know, if there's a good reason to hold on, then we'd absolutely consider it. Which part of the Finscape landscape are you seeing the best, most attractive opportunities at the moment? I wouldn't say there's one particular area within, I mean, it's a big, uh, it's a broad church and a lot of people interpret fintech in a variety of different ways. I think for us, we continue to see significant opportunity across a number of areas, whether it's, you know, wealth or asset management, um, you know, whether it's in the you know, what we would define as the, you know, B2B infrastructure. We still think there's a long way to go in uh, in digital banking. Of course, the uh, question which creates the most uh, debate is what's our view on crypto, on digital assets? And I think we've taken, uh, you know, a pretty uh, unambiguous view that we are not going to be providing investors exposure to a portfolio of crypto assets. However, we do believe that 
the digital asset space will continue to institutionalize and there needs to be an infrastructure in place that is fit for institutions to be able to hold digital assets. And so that's where our focus has gone in terms of backing businesses that take a long-term view that are going to build the infrastructure for the digital assets industry where institutions can and continue to, you know, to buy and sell and hold, whether it's to retail or other institutions. So that could be custody, that could be in, um, you know, analytics, that could be in compliance and uh, an AML as well. So there is a whole industry of infrastructure being built and that's where we've certainly built some exposure and continue to look at that space as well. And I wonder, how do you um, approach doing due diligence on companies? I, I noticed that you were on the board of Zopa, I think, at the same time as one of the other board members was arrested in India. Um, in connection with a money laundering probe, did, did that damage the company? And I mean, you know, in in that particular case, that was nothing to do with the company. That was uh, clearly related to the specific um, overseas uh, investor. So. Uh, who's no who's no longer on the board but you know ultimately for us when it comes to due diligence we uh, you know somewhat dependent on the maturity of of the company when you're backing a company with one or two years of um, trading history it's actually quite straightforward to do the due diligence there aren't a lot of skeletons in the closet you can get under the hood and you're really backing not just the concept you're fundamentally backing the team of course as a business is more established um, then there's a lot more scope and depth that that you can go into but for us really where we add the most value is towards the earlier stage at those kind of series a and b where businesses are two three four years old where we can really help them on that first kind of scale up journey and that's certainly where we prefer to to get involved grover recently completed a fundraise i wondered if you had any concerns about the subscription model businesses as cost of living emerges well i mean i think Subscription businesses, in particular for Grover's case, so Grover is a consumer electronics um, uh, proposition where you can rent by uh, by month. Um, and it's a real alternative to what I would regard as either ownership. So I think that will it will thrive in the current economic environment. Um, and two, a real alternative to what we're seeing now, an emerging uh, payment option for uh, millennials and Gen Y, which is buy now, pay later. And I think you've got to look at the consumer dynamics in a market such as Germany and Austria, where consumers have, you know, a different type of behavior where they prefer to rent rather than own. And it's a very kind of different behavior to perhaps my generation um, who, you know, have always felt that ownership was was better and couldn't necessarily see the justification for, you know, long-term rentals. So actually, I think that business model will thrive in a more challenging economic environment. I also think, you know, their emerging kind of B2B proposition where they're allowing businesses, schools, other educational establishments to, you know, rent, uh, you know, both hardware and software as well is a, is, is a real alternative. So I think I would kind of separate it from, I guess, the subscription <laughs> model that we've seen during the pandemic, the Pelotons and Netflixes uh, of the world. Um, and this is kind of an emerging sector, the one in which we think there's quite a lot of growth to come. Yeah. Did did the Wirecard scandal, has that left scars on the German fintech scene? Or was it a bit of a one-off rogue player? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a bit harsh to um, tar the whole German fintech scene with um, a kind of a real rogue player. Um no question it scarred the regulator, I think, in Germany. I think Baffin certainly has you know, taken a long, hard look, and I think there's clearly a, a fair amount of changes there. But, you know, all I can look at are the numbers coming out of Germany, and I think, you know, the German fintech scene is is booming. There's a lot of potential. There's a big consumer uh, audience there. Um, I think we're seeing it across, you know, Frankfurt, Berlin, Munich in particular, three cities where, you know, there is a you know strong investment um, ecosystem as well as kind of a founder ecosystem. So, yeah, I think there's a long way to go uh, in Germany. I think we're seeing more and more success stories come out of Germany. And I think, you know, the Wirecard scandal, um, albeit was, uh, you know, pretty ugly um, 
you know, story for for German fintech. I don't think it was indicative of you know the the market there, and and certainly I don't think we'll scar it for uh, uh, for much longer. But I'm sure that story will continue to run as <laughs> uh, as you'll be covering. Um, as we mentioned, the fund's got 24 holdings. You said some of them you invested in quite recently. What's the end goal in terms of? How big you think the fund can be? How many companies you'd want to own? How much money you'd be happy managing in it? There's no question that the strategy can tolerate a bigger fund. We're at about, at last nav, 267 million. Uh, we certainly think there's plenty of scope to grow that to half a billion pounds of permanent capital. What does that mean? A number of companies are at 24 now, as you said. Um, you know, we feel we have the capacity to do, you know, north of 30. What you won't see is a portfolio of 100 companies. I think if you did see that, then you can, um, you know, beat us with a stick to say, how can you spread yourself so thin? We will, uh, you know, at scale, write bigger checks. I think one of the things that we've certainly noticed um, over the past couple of years is that by being smaller and we listed at around 90 million, you're somewhat restricted with your capital base. And we have plenty of opportunity over the last two or three years to put more capital into something like Interactive Investor, which has been a fantastic return um, for us. And, you know, I think we've made 13 times our money. I think the challenge that stopped us from putting more money in was the size of the fund and we were going to become too heavily concentrated in one company. So scale is important. I think having the scale at the right time um, as the team scales, as our capacity scales. Um, and, you know, ultimately, I think we've got to go step by step. We've got to continue to put runs on the board and deliver tangible returns. And I think that there, you know, once we do that, it gives us the kind of the platform to be able to uh, to grow it. So I think if you sat down with me in a year or two and you saw 30, 35 businesses, um, I think that would probably be the uh, the max. I can't see us doing much more than that. Um, but equally, you know, as companies come into the portfolio, you know, companies go out, if you can get a, you know, good exit opportunity for them as well. How long do you think it'll take you to reinvest the proceeds from the Interactive Investor Sale? Um, I think for us, we're, we've always got a pretty burgeoning pipeline. We, at any one point, you can deploy um, whatever capital you have on, on your balance sheet. The question is, you know, can you deploy it effectively at the right price? And as I said earlier, one of the challenges we felt in this market was was pricing and valuations, and we wanted to be prudent. Um, so, you know, I think the one thing we've really built well over the past four years is a really strong um, pipeline, a strong network with the ecosystem. We would be monitoring um, you know, thousands of fintechs across Europe um, on our kind of CRM platform. So, you know, what what doesn't hold us back is kind of pipeline and opportunity. Of course, you've got to get the the deals over the line at the right terms. And I think what's held us back so far this year has just been, you know, the market where we've tried to, you know, put money in, but it hasn't quite been at the terms that we were comfortable with. And I think, you know, we, we think our investors would rather we remain disciplined and prudent in in that regard. But if I look at, you know, what we're focusing on at the moment, we would always look to put, you know, any significant capital that we have in our balance sheet to work within a nine month period. And that kind of very much six to nine months would really where we'd be looking. You're always going to keep a percentage back so you can follow on into your companies and support them, um, you know, as and when. But ultimately for us, you know, currently, if we're going to receive, you know, 45 million odd from, from Interactive Investor, you know, we would be looking to continue to deploy that over the next six to nine months. Great. Thank you so much. I mean, I'm sure we could keep going for hours, but I'm afraid we're out of time. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, Mary.